The emperor's armchair was four or five feet from the steps of the altar, with a small chair before it. The chairs of the Grand Marshal, Madame Bertrand, and Monsieur de Montsalon were placed on either side, and the emperor a little behind them. The members of the household remained standing near the screens. Abbe Bonavita said mass, Abbe Vignali and Napoleon Bertrand acting as servers. It was Vignali who gave the Bible to be kissed. The chapel was lighted only by the candles in the candelabra and chandeliers, as the glass door into the garden was concealed by the hangings. Mass was said every Sunday. The emperor was present at it unless he was indisposed or in bed. But in that case, they opened the door of his room in order that the priest's words might reach him. When Mass was finished and the emperor had gone into the garden, the chapel had become the dining room again in less than a quarter of an hour, and everything was restored to its previous condition one of the first Sundays. As the emperor was coming out of Mass, he said with a smile to those who were with him, I hope the Holy Father will not find fault with us. We have become Christians again. If he could see our chapel, he would grant us indulgences. And he went on, If any of you has a conscience overburdened with sins, one of you is there to take them and give you absolution. One day, I don't know how it came about, the priest came up into our corridor armed with holy water basin and a sprinkler and went through it, sprinkling it and stopping at every door where they said a prayer or two. This ceremony might be good for Italy or in Corsica for Italians, but it's St. Elena for Frenchmen who were far from devout. It was treated as a joke by those who lived in the corridor. A few weeks after the chapel was arranged, the emperor permitted Abbe Vignali to say mass every Sunday at the Grand Marshal's house, first in order that Madame Bertrand might not be obliged to come to Longwood, especially when the weather was bad, and then that people whom she knew who lived at the camp might be present at it. Many good Catholics were grateful to the emperor for this attention. The emperor's religion. Was the emperor religious in the sense which devotees give the word? I never saw any proof of it, but he was religious in the meaning which philosophers give to it. Although the emperor went to mass, was present at religious ceremonies, and had heard some sermons during his life, that was no reason why he should attach importance to religious observances or set much store by them. His mind rose higher, and consequently his belief was different from the common run of men who go to church. But it will be said that he went to Mass. Yes, but how did he understand it? He stood up when he had to stand up. He sat down when everybody did, knelt with them, and kissed the Bible when it was handed to him. During the divine service, his bearing was serious. His hat was under his left arm when he did not put it on the chair in front of him. And his right hand was generally in his trousers pocket and rattling some small change in it at the island of Elba. But he never made any other outward demonstration after the fashion of devotion. It sometimes happened to St. Helena that he would ask for a volume of the Bible during Mass. At St. Helena once, it was Holy Thursday that the chapel was set up, as was usual on Sundays and feast days, in the dining room, which was separated from the bedroom by a simple partition with the door opening through it. The emperor was ill and in bed that day. He had ordered the door to be left open during Mass, and when it was over, one of the priests had remained on his knees before the altar, as is customary to do on Holy Thursday before the tomb. The emperor was annoyed to know that the altar was still up and the priest there, and he said to Marchand with a frown, Have they finished? No, sire. Tell them to stop it. Monsieur Meneval followed Monsieur Voltaire's example, and he speaks of bells. The sound of a church bell proclaims a prayer, a mass, a death etc. Consequently, when one hears a bell, he remembers having heard in his youth the bell of his village or his parish, and that it called to such and such a religious exercise. At Brienne, the scholars were called to their studies, to the services, or to the refectory by a bell, and the emperor must naturally have remembered it. One no notices the ringing of a village bell, but not the carillon of the church bells of a large city. But our religious idea is always awakened by the sound of a bell. The effect which it makes generally depends on the state of mind in which one is. One notices if one is thoughtful or alone, but when the mind is occupied, the ear is deaf to it. At Elba, the church was close to the palace or the emperor's dwelling. There were large and small bells in it. 
They were wrong very early. They so deafened the new neighbors that the order was given that they should be wrong with greater moderation. No one ever knew or knows whether the emperor during the last days of his life had recourse to the consolations and help of religion. No one ever saw anything what can be called seeing. Abbe Vignali is the only person who knew whether or not the emperor indulged in the practices of religion. What I myself now what i remember very distinctly is that when the emperor came out of his room in the morning he would often say to the valet de chambre on duty open the doors and windows and let in the air which god has made he often said these words at saint helena